uh, gathering has been uh, uh, facilitated by the Phillip Island Land Alliance. It's a sort of a new collective of, uh, of all of the conservation groups here. So uh, yes, it's, uh, it's our first experience with, uh, with hosting a, um, uh, an event like this. So really, um, I think just this is an opportunity to to really uh, to know who else is working on the island, and uh, I encourage you really to you know not just listen to Gidja, but to um, ex you know share your your um, experiences, to ask lots of questions, to use it a bit as a, a chance to have a discussion about uh, what we're doing and what um, what we want to see happen. All right, I'll <laughs> so, hand over um, to Gidja now. It's really good that you've sort of joined an alliance because it means Sorry. that. Instead of um, having to do things ten times, you can join up on things and go for stuff together and go for grants together and get management happening. And and you're going to have just some of you will have just as much knowledge about weeds as I might in your particular areas. So that's why Keith said it's really good to discuss it and it's a discussion thing. And we're learning all the time. If we're not learning, we're dead. And this is relatively new. I mean. People looked at weeds, but now we're looking at them in more of an ecological sense. So the first question is, is it actually a weed? Now quite often I'll go to places and people are pulling out this thing they think's a weed, and it's not a weed. Um, and there are some plants where we're not really sure if they're weeds or not. They're all over the world. They're a bit what's called cosmopolitan. And there's some things that could have blown here naturally or whatever. So first thing is, is it a weed? And the next question, like, um, is it a problem? Now, some places, um, indigenous plants are seen as weeds because they've got out of control, but maybe that's due to our putting the wrong fire in at the wrong time, or, you know, why is it there? Why is it a problem? Is it a problem? Because sometimes it's not. It's just waiting for that succession to go through to the next stage. And um, you don't want to waste a lot of time doing stuff. People have a tendency to look at a whole patch of weeds and go, oh my God, but being able to prioritise which ones are the problems and which ones aren't, and whether they are a weed, is a major thing. So quite commonly things like a lot of the native senecios get seen as weeds. There's a plant on the beach I'm hoping still there that people think is a weed. That's a real prickly mother but it's actually an endangered plant. Um, I've seen endangered plants ripped up because people think they're weeds. And some of our most rarest plants in Australia are actually what we call ruderals, weeds. You know, things that produce a lot of seed go somewhere, come up. You know, like some of the cresses, the lepidiums, one of the rarest ones of those is under a pine tree in Hobart, you know, or it was. But, you know, those things, um, because a lot of the plants that come in have that same behaviour, they've taken over that niche. And some indigenous plants, like, they look like weeds, you know, and they are, people think, like, what makes a weed in, in terms of it making lots of seeds spreading, coming up everywhere, they have that behaviour. So the first step is the correct identification. So I've got some books in the car I'll show you, but some of the things I use to correctly identify stuff is um, the iNaturalist app, that's fantastic. In fact, on that, people were saying they were pulling out this rare plant because it was a terrible weed, and I had to say, no, it's a rare plant. So it means that people can comment and look at it and say, and you can get an idea on what about the plant. So that's a good one. I've got a weed book over there, Richardson, which is great. Um, there's often shy leaflets. There's, um, there's experts within your group who may know what the plant is. If it isn't, you can always take photographs of all the different bits of it and try and send it to someone who knows. As a last ditch effort, you probably go to the herbarium, but Gail's got a big list and he's the only one doing it at the moment. So if you can find other ways of working out what some of these plants are. I'm always happy if someone sends me a photo to help. 
Um, there's a lot of Facebook pages now where you can go on. There's the, um, you know, the Cape Blood runs one called Cape Blood Weeds. She's got a weeds one. So there's various Facebook pages. Um, Indigenous nurseries will often know if something belongs or if it's a weed. So they're really useful. But to do that, you sort of, you need to get the photos of the leaves, the flowers. You can't just send a, a leaf in or something or a piece of grass with no seed heads on it. I mean, I may know what it is from the legal because if it's something I've been familiar with, but I couldn't can say for sure if I didn't have all those bits. I'd say it's probably blah -de blah And it's all right to say probably if you're not sure. It's better than saying it's this and being wrong. Mm. So, and, and, and even people who, I mean, I've seen Poesi from Jeff Carr, who's an expert botanist, and it was like, what sort of Poesi? And he said, well, it looks like sweet burl on steroids, but it took a while to work out that it was Brachypodium dystachium. So um, it's okay to say you don't know. Don't try and make up something. Um, I've had um, chilling, um, serrated tussock being grown in a nursery and I'm saying it's serrated tussock and they're going, no, we asked someone and they said it was either a poa or a stiper and I thought, well, yep, they obviously didn't know. So it's better to, not to guess. <laughs> How did it get there? How long has it been there? Why is it there? So things like the marum grass that was brought in in the 1800s to Port Ferry and it was put on those sand dunes because they cleared all the sand dunes and they had stock grazing right to the beach. Similar here to Forest Caves where the that sand dune there's a building underneath that you know. The sand was moving so oh no the sand's moving we better put in marum grass comes from Europe. I've seen it actually in northern Denmark. It's quite amazing. But they've got flint beaches there. It's a bit different to here. So, um, and Marum creates a very steep dune front that then collapses. So it's been a bit of a problem along a lot of our coasts because the coasts are, the shape of the dunes determined by the plants that grow on it. So, um, and, and so it was brought into Port Ferry in um, 1893 and it's now been spread everywhere. Um, but now we can't just go and take it out because then we'll lose the coastline too, so how do you deal with it? Um, is it being utilised by indigenous fauna? You know, a lot weeds are habitat. In some areas, like in the Kuirup Swamp, the blackberries are really important for the bandicoots. You know, in, um, we'll see an area around here with the mistletoe, maybe the mistletoe bird in a weed. So it's about knowing if that plant's actually providing habitat. Mm -hmm. I've got, um, I, I manage a property on the Monero, at, at 2,700 acres of threatened grassy woodland, and um, the the rare birds up there, the diamond firetails and the double barred finches are utilising serrated tussock and briar rose. So if you take all the briar rose out from those areas, there's no movement for the birds to get across. And until we get the Bessaria and the Cassinias coming back there, they're, they're going to lose their habitat. So it's important to spend a bit of time on a place and not go, and it's important to go slowly and systematically and keep an eye out for habitat values because you, might, you don't want to lose the last vestige of some patch of blue wrens or, you know, we lost the blue wrens along our road when they took out all the box thorns. And um, they nearly lost a rare skink, a genia, up near um, Rock Bank because they were taking the box thorns out of the cliffs and that's what the berries, they were, that's how they got in there. So food, habitat and things but utilising it are really important. and and um, I often get overlooked. So be really mindful of that. Um, things like the meadow argus butterfly feeds on um, the plantains and the, um, the shade pellitory. If you haven't got shade pellitory or nettles, then the, then the Australian animals often um, feeding on introduced nettle. And so um, 
you know, been having a bit of an idea on that, and that's why it's good to go slowly. So the other one is, is it hazardous to wildlife? Now we've got a problem with some of the box thorns around the mutton bird rookeries. Over on French Island, we're sort of, that's sort of been replaced by the um, tree violet, um, Metisitisus, used to be, um, have a different name. <laughs> Things change names all the time. Um, so the ox tongue, I've seen that in Tukaruk Swamp and you've got quite a few wetlands on the island. Mm. For a while there, I was getting rid of the spear thistle thinking it was bad. Then I realised the frogs were hiding in the spear thistle from over there we've got foxes, we don't have them. Um, but they were using it to hide in during the day. And, um, and I noticed that the thistle had a weevil in the seed heads and a rust and it wasn't producing any seed anyway. So, but the ox tongue was just rough and I hadn't even looked at it. And then I saw it covered in dead frogs, oh. dead sawfly larvae, mm. you know, like it, it's, um, I've forgotten what the name of it, coprophilic or something. Anyway, it's, um, oh, really? it, 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 mm. it, and another thing that does that is wild teasel. And I'm not sure if the moth vine does it as well, but some plants actually produce more seed if they've killed something. Oh, they right. absorb it. And I think the glandular hairs on the ox tongue must it's, have some toxin yeah, in it. Yeah, it's very prickly and... Yeah, well, it's sort of rough, but, yeah. you know, it's... Um, so there's things like that that are actually hazardous to wildlife and you don't really want them around. In a swamp, it wouldn't be so bad, you know. But they're more likely to be in a swamp. So, that's the other thing is we chose the. Yeah. It's funny that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It happens. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's called fulfilling the niche. So, um, and it's mindful to keep in mind. It's good to keep in mind that. I'll just talk really loud. It's good to keep. Tell me if you can't hear me. And it's good to keep in mind that plants, um, weeds occur in communities just like other plants do. They occur on certain tall soil types, in certain habitats, certain proximity to marine influences, you know, certain um, situations of high or low disturbance. So, you know, they occur in these communities um, just the same. So you're not going to find some of the 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 sand rocket, the cacolets on the beach, you're not going to find that up at the cemetery at Rill, you know, in a grassy woodland. So weeds, but you'll find that some weeds you think will only grow in this habitat. So, um, but we're finding with some plants like Italian buckthorn, that if you Google it on Wikipedia, it says it grows yay high. Well, in a swamp in Tukaruk, it grows twice that high even more and no one knew it could grow in a swamp mm. yeah. they thought it was on terrestrial areas mm. you know mind you the seedlings get killed if it's flooded for too long a period but you know um, things are going outside their expected range a bit but um, so it's good to be mindful of that and that's something that people in the field are more likely to note than someone in an office studying it so that's where f um, our naturalist comes in because you can expand the range and you can have it in different places. Mm -hmm. um, and then a, another question is what pollinates it and how is it seed spread? So pollination mechanisms are interesting um, and quite complex. Sometimes they're quite specific and sometimes they're not. Some things, most grasses are wind pollinated. Um, some orchids have got very specific pollinators. Others have more general pollinators. Some plants weren't a problem until introduced bees came in because they can hold the pollen and so it can cross from barriers that normally that would flower at a different time to that. Mm. Um, with some species like um, willows, they weren't a problem until other willows were brought in because they're sort of outcrossing and then they hybridised and then it got worse. Um, so the how it's pollinated and then how the seed that's produced moves is important. Things like um, 
Soursop, Oxalis pes capri, doesn't produce seed in Victoria, but it does apparently in Western Australia. Um, so that may vary, or some things that you think not going to produce seed suddenly start producing seed. I saw seedlings of wandering Tradescantia once, you know, but, and the periwinkle, they don't produce many seed, but they do produce seed, and John Eddie's shown me photos, so, but it's not very common, but some things may actually start to do more of that if they, over time, adapt to that. I know that some orchids have gone to New Zealand and they didn't have the pollinators, so they moved their male and female parts of their flower together and they do it inside the flower now. <laughs> so, you know, plants are, we're all evolving, just like plants are, and we're part of the system as well. So, and is it seed spread by blackbirds? Well, then if you've got blackbirds, then you're going to have ivy, then you're going to have this, and you're going to have that. Um, other things might be spread by ants. Other things might be spread by by vehicles, on feet, you know, and um, and don't just think about the weeds, think about all the funguses too. So Phytophthora, I've heard there's none on the island, but I don't know that they've done enough testing to test that, um, but that's a question. Um, we've got myrtle rust now come into Australia, and I know Sapphire McMullen, who's a fungi expert, she has a different hat if she goes to different states because she doesn't want to spread myrtle rust. Mm. And it comes, because it comes from the air down, you see, whereas Phytophthora comes from your feet and it's a micro, um, it's a, quite a little motile spore, like a sperm, and it can swim through water. It can get through root-to-root -root contact. It can um, be stored as a little spore called a chlamydia spore that's got a hard coat in gravel for 20 years. Oh, That's how it got into Wilson's Palm. <coughs> it's in um, in New Zealand, the ancient trees that people used to have bare feet and walk into and now got tourists walking that's just... Oh. They've got quarantine areas in Tasmania and a lot of the Banksias in Western Australia now are only known from tissue culture. Oh. So um, some things are susceptible and some aren't. So rough bark eucalypts, heathland plants, they're susceptible, whereas sedges and other things aren't so susceptible, but it's a disaster and um, grass trees are affected. So, and, and what it does is it makes the roots go like, they've got arthritis. So in a wet year like this year, it won't show up much, but as soon as you get a dry year, bang, it can't absorb the water and everything starts dying, then that's a potential. And that can be spread by lots of different things, you know. Um, some weeds are bullies and some aren't, you know? It's like some people, even some animals. You go, oh no, that possums don't do that, and then it suddenly does, and you go, well, some are just... <laughs> um, so, and, and so there's some that just sit there, and they may actually be just doing nothing, and then there's... I got worried once because there's this stink hawk called, um, it used to be Inula graviolans, I think it's something like, Districia graviolans. And it was along the roadsides in um, the Grampians, and I freaked out. I went, oh, no, look at all this. They've graded the road, and look at all this. Well, I need to worry, because next year I came back, and they'd all gone, they'd moved on, and now it was all fairies' aprons down the side of the road. Mm -hmm. So you could spend a lot of time on those sort of plants, but they're not actually a problem. They're just going to move, and they're just there because of some disturbance. And often they're high on the list because of agricultural problems, not environmental problems. So that's good to keep in mind. Some are kept in check by indigenous fauna, you know, like um, um, blackberries. If I take a branch off the blackberry patch that's laid on top of it, and the wallabies can get in, they can eat it down to nothing. Mm -hmm. And blackberries only produce fruit on the second year cane, so that's a really good containment method. Mm -hmm. And then when you see the, um, the, what's it called? Those bees that eat out the hole, leaf cutter bees, eating holes in it all, and then you see those blue flick beetles come in, and, oh, right. and, and then you see the so regen happening underneath, good, and good it's barely got a control. leaf on it. Mm. You go, well, actually, I'll go and move over to this other weed, <laughs> and I'll deal with that later. Mm. Mm. Containment's the first step. Mm. Don't go for elimination straight off. You'll be, you don't want to disappoint yourself, and mm. you don't want to, you, you, you don't want to cut off, bite off more than you can chew. Mm. That's a particularly Victorian term I've heard from the New South Wales, my New South yeah. Wales colleagues. 
Um, it can also um, be kept in check by natural processes. Like you might have an area that's weedy, 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 and then you have a wet year and it floods and all the weeds go away mm. or yeah. something mm. like can't that. Can't cope with the water. Yeah, yeah, can't cope with the water. And I've just seen all the cypresses this year die in Tookrook Swamp because um, they didn't cope with the, mm. the, the... It's not just the height of inundation, it's how long it hangs mm. around for mm. and all that sort yeah. of stuff. So, um, and and I've seen flooding of thistles, I've seen flooding of Italian buckthorn, I've seen, mm. you know, a lot of different um, processes that have that. And I've even seen, um, I weeded, I mowed an area for fire control in through a grassland area that was full of um, that little onion weed, Romulea. We used to call it mm. plum puddings at school because you sat mm. on the edge of the oval and ate it. What happened is I mowed it and the rabbits came in and ate all the Romulea and left the blade of grass and the herbertias. So then I thought, oh, well, I'll just mow this next section. <laughs> so that's how I did it. So if you can utilise indigenous or exotic fauna while you've got it and then get rid of the exotic fauna later, <laughs> then, um, you know, when it starts attacking everything else, then, um, you know, that's a... So, but you need to spend time on a place to actually observe that and see that. And, and it does take time. Biocontrol agents really keep things in track often and sometimes they just appear. It's the most expensive form if you're doing it as a research thing because you have to get to the actual third generation of the insect to make sure you're not bringing in any parasites out of the insect guts and all this sort of stuff. So mm. they've got to go through a lot of different processes these days and it's not the same as it was when the cane toad days. Um, I've just been up to Wiperfeld last year and it was covered in whorehound and Barry Sampson, a weed, you know Barry, do you? Yeah. Oh, well, he's a weed fella. F um, and he went and introduced the clear wing moth to Wiperfeld. Anyway, I'd, I'd seen Wiperfeld in the old days where it was just whorehound and native licorice glycerate plus a riser in the um, black box flats. And I went there this time ago and what's all that dead stuff? Wow, look at all the region. No. And then I realised, oh, yeah, the whorehound. That's right, he introduced. So the clear wing moth that eats the whorehound, it can smell its mates for five kilometres. Wow. Which is fun, yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's, wow. that's, it, it, won't, it won't eliminate it, but it's actually made it integrated now. Like yeah. our trees, when they go to Africa, they turn into tall forest trees because they don't have the galls and the insects and the longicorns and stuff that eat them. Mm. And um, our blackwood goes pink mm. from the yellow black to it comes mm. back pink. So um, you wonder what happens there. But we've got the weeds here and that's the same thing. So the um, Vipers bugloss at Mount Oak, where I manage on the Narago country on the Monero Plains, um, that used to be whole purple hills and the beekeepers are coming and want the purple honey until Japan banned it. Um, but what happened is one year, and I was with the Friends of Grasslands, Margaret Ning, and she's going, it looks like the frost's attacked it. And I'm looking at it, I'm going, no, that's a leaf miner. And oh, look, it's all black and red in the middle. Oh, that looks like a weevil. So, and we didn't know at the time whether it was ones that also came off the native cyanoglossums, their cousins, but um, Ian Faithful said, no, no, it's one off that. But it's found its way there. And now, instead of having a thousand rosettes in coming up in a square metre, we've now got one plant going to flower there and one over there, and all the indigenous flat plants have come back in and filled that niche. Because it's about niches. So often weeds are just taking the niche of something that's missing. So if you've got a problem with thistles, often it's because the senecios and the other native, their cousins are missing. Um, if you've got blackberry issues, then find out where your patch of native raspberry is and move it out. Um, um, Bacaria and sweet potosperum. You know, if, if you're missing something, often it's indicative by what the weed problem is and you don't want to take it out just like that, um, unless it's a new invasion. Um, you don't want to take it out just like that because you might be removing some food source or habitat.